we're going to be going to read chapter 5. And a little historical background is that this was published in 1893, and uh, there was a very big depression in the United States during that time. So let's get to chapter 3. Apologies that I didn't come on yesterday. Let's get to chapter five. Maybe I should start this over and not even talk about that. I hope you don't mind. Okay, so that's chapter four. And we're coming to five in a minute. Go, here we go. Chapter 5, I'm going to jump right in, although it does have a little header here. It says, Up and still up, and through the quarries of the demons, how the castle kept the trail, and how we came at last upon the brink of the giant's well. The terraces are safely past, beginning of the descent into the well itself. All the difficulties overcome, we reach the edge of the polyphemous funnel. Okay, I think I'm going to turn my fan off so it doesn't bother you. Hold on a second. Now it's just CAC in the background. <clears throat> Excuse me. Generally speaking, people with very large heads are fitted out by nature with a pair of rather pipy stemmy legs. But such was not my case. I was blessed with legs of the sturdiest sort and found no difficulty in keeping pace with my new four-footed friends who, in my delight, were not long in convincing me that they had been there before. Not for one instant did they halt at any fork in the path, but kept continually on the move, often passing over stretches of ground where there was no trail visible. But coming upon it again with unfailing accuracy, once only they halted, and that was to slake their thirst at the mountain rill, Bulger and I following their example. It was only too evident to me that they had in mind a certain grazing ground and were resolved to be satisfied with no other, so I let them have their own way. For, as it was still up, 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 I felt that it was perfectly safe to follow their lead. At last the mountainside began to take on quite another character. The gorges grew narrower, and at times overhanging rocks shut out the sunlight almost entirely. We were entering a region of peculiar wildness, a fantastic grandeur. I had often read of what travels termed the quarries of the demons in the northern Urals. But never till now had I the faintest notion of what the expression meant. <clears throat> Imagine yourself the usual look of wound and devastation. Around and about a quarry worked by human hands, then in your thoughts conceive every chip to be a block and every block to be a mass, add four times its size, to every slab and post and pediment, and then turn a mighty torrent through the place and roll and twist and lift them up in wild confusion. End on end and on each pile till the wild waters have builded fantastic portals to temples more fantastic and arched wild gorges 
with hooves of rock which seemed to hang so lightly that a breath or a footfall might bring them down with a terrible crash. And then, dear friends, you might you may succeed in getting a faint idea of the wild and awful grandeur of the scene which now lay spread out before me. Would the cattle that had now led Bulger and me so safely up the mountainside know where to find an entrance to this wilderness of broken rock? And what was more important still, would they, when once engaged within its winding courts and corridors, its darkened maze of wall and parapet, its streets and plazas, roughly paved, as if by demon hands, impatient of the task, know how to find their way out again. Dear friends, man has always been too distrustful of his four-footed companions. They have much that they might tell us, had they but speech to tell it with. I have often trusted them when it would have seemed full-heartedly to you, and never once have I had cause to repent of doing so. So Bulger and I, with stout hearts, followed straight after these silent guides, although I must confess my legs were beginning to feel the terrible strain I had put them to. But I resolved to push ahead at least until we had cleared the demon's quarry, and then to bring my little herd to a halt and pass the rest of the day in the night season, in well-earned repose. Once within the quarry, however, all sense of fatigue vanished, and my thankful mind, entranced and fascinated by the deep silence, the awful grandeur, the mysterious lights and shadows of the place, lent me new strength. At length we traversed the city of silence and gloom, and once again we emerged into the full glory of the afternoon sun. Suddenly my little drove of cattle, with playful tossing of their heads, <coughs> excuse me, broke, <coughs> excuse me, into a run. Bulger and I, at their heels, however, it was a mad race, but dear friends, when it ended, I took off my fur cap and tossed it high in the air with a wild cry of joy, and Bulger broke out in a string of yelps and barks, for look ye, the cattle were grazing away for dear life, there in front of me, and as their breath reached me, my keen nostrils recognized the odor of Yulana's herbs, which she had bound on my hurt head. Yes, we stood almost upon the brink of the giant's well. But I was too tired to take another step farther, too tired, in fact, to eat. Although I had stock of dried fruit in my pockets, and noticed the nests of the wild fowl were well supplied with eggs. Having unloosened the tackle from the back of the good beast that had carried it up the mountain for me, I threw myself on the ground and was soon fast asleep, with my faithful bulger coiled up against my breast. In the morning the cattle were nowhere to be seen, but I didn't trouble myself about them, for I knew that old Yolanda would be sent up after them the moment they were missed. After a hearty breakfast of half a dozen roasted eggs of the wild fowl and some dried fruit and wintergreen berries, Bulger and I advanced to the edge of the giant's well, or rather to the edge of the vast terraces of rocks leading down to it, each of which was thirty to fifty feet in sheer height. 
Before I go any farther, dear friends, I must beg you to remember that I am an expert in the use of tackle. There being no knot, noose, or splice known to a sailor, which I didn't have my fingers ends, a fact not to be wondered at when you will, when you take into consideration the thousands of miles which I have traveled on water. Nor would I have you shake your heads and look only half persuaded when I go on describing our descent into the giant's well. For of course you'll be asking yourselves how I succeeded in getting the tackle down when there was no one left at the other end to untie it. Know then that was the smallest of my troubles, for as any seller will tell you, you only need to tie your line in what is known as the fool's knot, at one end of which you make fast a mere cord. The moment you have reached the bottom, a sharp tug at the cord unties the fool's knot, and your tackle falls down after you. My method was to lower Bulger down first, and then let myself down after him. In this way, we proceeded from the parapet to parapet, until at last we stood upon the very edge of the vast well, the existence of which had been so mysteriously hinted at in Dom Thumb's manuscript. Its mouth was probably fifty feet in width, and by straining my eyes, I satisfied myself of the existence of a shelf of rock on one side, as nearly as I could judge, about seventy-five feet down. It was a goodly stretch, and would require every foot of my rope. You will not smile, I'm sure, when I tell you that I pressed Bulger to my breast and kissed him fondly before lowering away. He returned my caresses, and by his joyous yelp gave me to answer that he had perfect faith in his little master. In a few moments I had joined him on this narrow shelf of the rock. Below us now was darkness. But think you I hesitated? I knew that my eyes would soon become accustomed to the gloom, and I also knew that when my eyes failed to Bulger's keener ones were there to help me out. I rigged my tackle now with extra care, for I was really lowering my little brother on a sort of trip of discovery. He was soon out of sight, and then, in spite of my calmness, I drew a quick breath, and my heart started upward, a barley corn or so. But hark! His quick, sharp bark comes plainly up to me. It means that he has landed upon a safe shelf or ledge and the next moment my legs encircle the rope and I begin to glide noise, noiselessly down into the stilly depths, his glad voice ringing in my ears. Again and again did I send my wise and watchful little brother down ahead of me until at last standing there and looking up naught remained to me to the mighty outside world, but a bright silver speck, like a tiny ray of light, streaming through a pinhole in the curtains of your chamber. But stop! Have we reached the bottom of the giant's well? For with a trial plummet, I find that the walls are no longer sheer. They slope inward, and gently too, almost so much so that I hardly need a line to continue my descent. Lighting one of my little tapers, I made my way cautiously around the edge. In half an hour, I find myself back at the starting place. The curve of the path is always the same, 
while my trial plummet at all times has indicated the same slope to the rocky basin. And then for the first time, two certain words made use of by the learned master of masters, Don Farm. Till then, a mystery to me stood out before my eyes as if written with a pen a fire upon those black walls thousands of feet below the great world of light which I had quitted a few hours before. Those words were Polyphemus Funnel. Yes, there could be no doubt of it. I'd reached the bottom of the giant's well. <clears throat> I stood upon the edge of the Polyphemus Funnel. Chapter 6 will be read next time.